Hello, everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Lin Ying Zhang. Lin Ying Zhang is a doctoral candidate at the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. Her work centers on causal machine learning methods for reliable evidence generation from observational data with emphasis on population level treatment effect estimation and fairness of clinical decision making. Her work has been published in various machine learning conferences and informatics journals. Lin Ying has also collaborated with multidisciplinary teams to develop predictive models across several medical disciplines, including endocrinology, nursing, and COVID-19. Prior to her PhD, Lin Ying received her MS from Harvard School of Public Health and her BA from Boston University. It is my pleasure to introduce the future Dr. Lin Ying Zhang. Yeah, all right, how you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Abu Dhabi. Our talk today. <laughs> okay, hold on. I think that we might have a problem here. Somebody. Um, okay. Are, are we good? Wonderful. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce the soon to be Dr. Lin Ying Zhang. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you for such a great introduction. Let me uh, share my slides. I can see right. them great. Good, good. I hope you can see it clearly and hear me clearly. I am Lin Ying Zhang. I'm a PhD candidate in biomedical informatics at Columbia University. I'm really excited to be talking with you today about how we can improve the reliability of real world evidence generation in healthcare. Can we trust AI? So what's the hardest AI models these days? It's definitely ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a large language model that is trained on all the text on the internet, and it can almost answer all the questions that you throw at it, like writing emails, translating text, writing and debugging code, among many others. Right, while ChatGPT has really showed us the great potential for AI to revolutionize the way we work and interact with technology, can we trust it, what it tells us without verifying it? Right? As clearly as the advice developers and as we have seen from our own experiences, ChatGPT sometimes writes plausible sounding but incorrect or nonsensical answers. And this reliability crisis is not a unique to ChatGPT but to all similar machine learning or AI based models in general. So with the widespread of ChatGPT, it really has made the reliability of AI a pressing concern for the general public. But I will argue this problem isn't new to us researchers, machine learning researchers in healthcare. Can we trust a predictive models in healthcare? In the past few years, we have seen an explosion of AI and machine learning based predictive models for healthcare applications. They're published on like top tier scientific journals. However, when some of these models are deployed in real clinical setting, they often fail to meet our expectations. For example, on the left uh, is a study that uh, about uh, Epic sepsis prediction model. It's a model that was implemented in the Epic EHR system and it was deployed across hundreds of hospitals. However, this study found that this prediction model fails to identify two thirds of patients with sepsis, despite creating alerts for about 20% of the patients. In other cases, even on average, when a model has a reasonable performance, it can still underperform or fail at specific tasks. So on the right is a meta-analysis of Watson for Oncology. It's an AI system that uses machine learning algorithms to assist physicians in cancer treatment decision-making. And this meta-analysis found that even though this model had an overall concord concordance rate about 80% between the model and the human expert team, but still the model have, was less consistent in specific uh, cancer types when, they, when it would um, make a recommendation for specific cancer types. And also the model has a poor generalizability when it is deployed in a different country than uh, that's very different. Has very different clinical uh, guidelines and uh, methods for treating particular cancer uh, in a different country. 
And this story is not unique to just predictive models, but also to observational studies uh, using observational healthcare data. Real-world health data have been used frequently in answering questions like, you know, the effectiveness and what's the effective, effectiveness and safety of uh, medications. And if during the if you remember during the beginning of COVID-19, there were a lot of studies like that of a, like studying hydroxychloroquine. And a lot of those papers were later on, uh, no matter where they were initially published, the later on they were retracted due to unreliable research. And here are just two examples of those COVID-19 papers. But I'll argue there's hope, even though there's a lack of reproducibility and issues of generalizability of using real world data, there's hope. We can do better. And here are two encouraging studies. On the left, a group of researchers attempt to reproduce results for 150 observational studies while using the same clinical database as the original study. And they reported that the effect sizes were positively correlated between their reproductions and the original research. And so this is great. This study showed us a different group of researchers while following the same study protocol uh, as the original study can, and use the same database, they can get similar results as from the original uh, research. But what if the original observational study is wrong, or right? it has a flawed uh, study design? But then being able to reproduce the same wrong answer from the same database didn't get us any closer to the true scientific discovery. So in other words, given that randomized controlled trials do the gold standard, can, how can we reproduce randomized controlled trials using observational studies? Maybe that will give us more confidence about observational research. And that's basically what this group of researchers did. Uh, they, this researchers from the Odyssey Network published a study in JAMIA showed that in a hypertension study, uh, 28 out of the 30 effective estimates from their observational study were in agreement with the findings in the RCT. So together, the studies suggest that we can do better with observational studies to generate more reliable and reproducible real-world evidence. And the question is how? And this is where my research broadly fits in. I think now is a fantastic time. It's a really exciting time to work on machine learning and healthcare with observational data because there's an enormous amount of such data. For example, electronic health records, medical images, clinical notes, genomics, and other omics data, and also data, uh, sensoring data and uh, patient generated data from wearable devices. So this data all captured uh, information about health, but from very different perspective on the, in different settings. And in the future, I'd like to integrate different types of data to improve uh, model performance and to improve the reliability of real world evidence. Uh, for my PhD research, however, I uh, mainly use EHR and that will be the focus of my talk today as well. So electronic health record, EHR, is a digital version of patients' medical information. EHRs contain diverse information about the patient during a clinical encounter, like in a hospital. And that kind of information typically include like demographics, uh, drugs, clinical procedures, conditions, lab measurements, and uh, observations like survey answers. These clinical concepts are represented by different medical vocabularies. Things you might heard of like STOMAD, ARCS norm, LOIC, and so on. And this can be very high dimensional data. Just to give you a, a sense of it, for example, in the OMAP common data model, uh, it standardized different vocabulary, 135 different vocabularies across all clinical domains. And that includes millions of concepts, tens of millions of concepts and concept relationships. So generating reliable evidence from such a large scale, uh, messy real world data uh, is a challenge and that requires unique tools, uh, special tools and knowledge. With the data and proper methods, we can answer, uh, we can generate evidence at three levels. So first is characterization, counting things, how often things happen. For example, how prevalent is a hypertension uh, at Colorado what are the preferred first-line treatment for hypertension? 
The second is prediction. You can think things from the past to predict things in the future. For example, predicting hospital readmission, uh, ICU mortality, and uh, many other specific health outcomes. And we've seen a lot of research in this area. The third is a causal estimate, estimation. So sometimes we're not just satisfied with modeling association, like in prediction model, uh, we want to know the causal effect of an intervention. For example, a drug, a clinical procedure, right? what, for example, you might, we might be interested in the question, what is the effect of metformin on blood glucose? And estimation can also be about quantifying the effect of race or sex on clinical decision making. For example, how does a patient's race affect doctor's decisions on uh, uh, giving a patient a treatment or not? And here are some of my works uh, related to evidence generation. I have worked on uh, developing machine learning based uh, predictive models across a variety of uh, clinical applications with uh, Dr. Lauren Richter, a pediatric endocrinologist. In our lab, we developed uh, machine learning models for predicting post-bariatric surgery outcomes in adolescents with type 2 diabetes. And I also collaborated with Dr. Wen Yu Song from Harvard uh, Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital at Boston. Uh, we developed machine learning models for predicting uh, hospitalization among COVID positive patients using EHRs. And we also developed uh, models for predicting pressure injury among hospitalized patients using uh, features extracted from uh, nurse flow sheets. So uh, this project, in, uh, we work together with uh, nurses uh, in our team. Oops. Oh. Sorry. Um, so I enjoy working with uh, multidisciplinary multi teams, uh, including physicians, nurses, statisticians, and informaticians on this great project. And I would like to continue uh, this line of research but for my uh, talk today, I will focus on my work in developing and applying causal inference to EHRs. That includes work on reducing unmeasured confounding in observational studies for drug effect estimation and also health equity evaluation from a causal perspective. So first I would like to talk about how we can improve reliability of treatment effect estimation in observational studies. This work was published in Journal of Biomedical Informatics last year. So to set up the problem, uh, let's begin with the data set of patients. We observed that in the data set, some patients took the medication. We call this group the treatment group. And uh, some patients did not take the medication. We call this group the control group. And sometimes this can be an alternative treatment and uh, called the comparator group. So uh, there are two outcomes that could happen for a given patient. The outcome that would happen if the patient takes the medication, uh, that's Y1, and the outcome that would happen if the patient does not take the medication, uh, Y0. So these are called the potential outcomes uh, in causal inference. So which one we observe depends on the treatment assignment. Now, let's imagine the doctor and the team ask a question, right? how effective is the treatment on average? So the average treatment effect uh, can be mathematically expressed as this, right? That's the mean of the difference of the two potential outcomes across the population. However, the difference, this individual level difference in our potential outcomes is never observed for any individual. So this is now as the fundamental problem of causal inference. And so how can we estimate the treatment effect when we have an unobserved causal uh, quantity? So I haven't told you how the treatment is assigned. Imagine if this is a randomized controlled trial where, where the treatment is randomly assigned, then that means the two groups, the treatment and control groups, are not different in their baseline uh, patient characteristics. So often called the two groups are exchangeable. When this is the case, then this average treatment effect can be uh, expressed just as the difference in the outcome between the treatment and the control group. And this, this quantity is directly uh, observed in the data. However, randomized controlled trial is not always a viable option because it is very expensive. It takes a long time to run. And some of the treatment 
we may not be able to randomize it because of ethical reasons. And randomized controlled file, the, the estimate may not be generalizable because of the strict eligibility criteria. So how can we estimate causal effects with observational data? Right, that means the treatment is not randomized, like in observational data, EHRs. Then this causal effect is no longer, the average treatment effect is no longer equal to the difference in outcomes between the two groups. And that is known as a confounding bias, one of the reasons of confounding bias. So what is a confounder? Confounder is a variable that affects both the treatment assignment and the outcome of interest. Right. For example, if I were going to study the effect of carrying matches on the risk of getting lung cancer, the treatment is not randomized. People who are smokers are more likely to carry matches around, and we know that smoking causes lung cancer. So in this study, smoking status is a confounder. Without adjusting for smoking, I would get a wrong answer that carrying matches increases the risk of getting lung cancer. So in order to reduce confounding bias, we need to adjust for all confounders in our study. So how? Propensity score is one of the probably most popular method for confounding adjustment. Propensity score, it is a probability of a patient receiving the treatment given the patient's baseline characteristics. The true propensity scores are not directly observed in the data, but it can often be estimated, like for example, using a logistic regression. And that's what is often done in practice. The independent, uh, the dependent uh, variable is the assigned the treatment and the independent variable, we call, often called the input to that regression model is a set of variables that are, that are believed to be confounders, variables that we want to adjust for. Once we fit a propensity model, then we can use the estimated propensity scores in various ways to remove confounding. For example, in matching, each treated patient is matched with a control patient with the closest uh, propensity score. And so matching of propensity score helps to balance the treatment and control groups, and that helps reduce the influence of confounders on the effect estimate. The propensity scores can also be used in other ways like stratification and uh, as a weighting metric to uh, remove confounding. So now we have a method for adjusting for confounding, but how are confounders selected in the first place? There are some common approaches. So first, confounders uh, are, can be selected based on domain knowledge. Like medical experts suggest about what the variables are confounders based on their medical training and experience. Second is through literature review. A researcher can go through the uh, existing li literature and find out what variables are selected by other researchers who study the same research question. And sometimes that can be estimated, uh, modeled based on the empirical association in the data. So how well do observational studies agree on confounders? As an example, I did a search for published studies that compare hydrochlorothiazide versus lisinopril. Both are uh, antihypertensive medications and on the outcome, acute myocardial infarction. Here are some studies that I found. The finding is that, and I highlight them based on uh, how well do studies agree on the different uh, set of confounders. I found that on, in general, studies agree well on variables like age, sex, like demographic factors. There's some variables that studies, they, are, uh, they partially agree on a set of variables. For example, because this is a hypertension study, all studies uh, agree that baseline hypertension, baseline cardiovascular condition is a, is a, a confounder. However, they, some studies, this first study adjusted for that by including uh, antihypertensive medications. Uh, the second study adjusted for that by including uh, conditions like likely diagnosis codes. The third studies include uh, specifically blood pressure measurements. And the fourth study mentions hypertension, but it's unclear what variables they, they use to, to represent hypertension. 
And I found that some of the variables are in, uh, there's a lack of agreement on some of the variables. For example, two studies mentioned, uh, think that uh, lung diseases are confounders, uh, although their definition, their, their granularity of lung disease is uh, very, uh, they, they define lung disease at different granularity. And the one study mentioned that it uh, thinks that dementia is a confounder. From this example, we saw there was a lack of agreement among manually selected confounders in observational studies. And this is not uh, unique to this particular hypertension example I pick up. Um, so, right, what can go wrong with uh, this lack of agreement on confounders? This can lead to bias in our, in our causal effect estimates. Sorry, uh, my slides have their own mind. <laughs> And when we miss a confounder, that will lead to biased uh, effect estimate. This poor agreement on confounders across studies can weaken the reliability of evidence from real world data. So in contrast to manually picking covariates based on domain knowledge or literature review, in our lab and in the Odyssey network, we use a systematic approach to adjust for confounding and we call this method large-scale propensity score, or LSPS. So instead of manually selecting confounders, LSPS adjusts for all variables available in the, in, the, in the database in a propensity score model. That is all demographics, all diagnosis, all drugs, all procedures, and all labs. So by adjusting for all covariates, we we'll should not miss the confounder that is measured and included in the database. Although we do not know that there are some variables that we should avoid because including them can actually induce bias. And we have various uh, ways, either through study design or diagnostics to prevent including those variables. Right, so on a, uh, to summarize on a high level RLSPS, this method includes nearly all covariates in the propensity score model uh, to adjust for confounding. Then we use propensity scores as uh, in traditional uh, observational research to do matching or stratification to create matched cohorts. So then we'll check covariate balance between the matched groups. That is, we compare the mean of each covariate between the two groups before and after matching. When a covariate is included in the propensity score model, then this covariate balance is uh, somewhat expected. But what has been uh, interesting to us is that a study run by my colleague, Dr. Ray Chen, uh, found that a confounder, even if a confounder was not included in a propensity model, it can still undergo balance after matching when we include the rest large scale covariates in our uh, approach. So this indicates that RSPS can balance on uh, confounders that are not explicitly included in the model that are like, unmeasured or in this case uh, held out uh, confounders. So my research investigates this phenomenon and provides theoretical foundations for why LSPS can adjust for unmeasured confounder. So here's the intuition. We know that variables in the EHRs are highly correlated. For example, patients with a hypertension not only have hypertension diagnosis codes, but are also more likely to be prescribed with antihypertensive medications, uh, have their blood pressure measured more often, and uh, may more likely to have comorbidities like diabetes, uh, in, and those are all observed in their medical records. So in, in other words, variables that are correlated in the EHRs because they're generated from the same underlying health state of a patient. So how likely is it for a confounder to be completely unmeasured, like com completely uncorrelated with the large set of covariates that we observe in the EHR? If that really is the case, then all bets are off. We cannot adjust for that variable. We can do sensitivity analysis instead. Uh, but how likely is that the case, right? So if there's some correlation between the measured covariates and the unmeasured confounder, then by including a large set of measured covariates, there's hope that we can partially, if not all, adjust for the unmeasured confounder. So that is the intuition. 
And here uh, I'll put into more formal uh, definitions. So on the left, this is the situation we worry about. We want to estimate a causal effect, but we worry that there is an unmeasured confounder that can bias our effect estimate. However, if this unmeasured confounder can, is, can be uniquely determined based on the measured covariance, a condition we call pinpointing, then by adjusting for just the measured covariance, we can have an unbiased effect estimate. Because in this case, we no longer have an unmeasured confounder. It is indirectly, we call it indirectly measured confounder in, uh, in the study. However, pinpointability is just an assumption, right? It's saying like, if I have perfect information about the unmeasured confounder, then I'm, I'm good, I have unbiased estimates. But when this pinpoint bullet does not hold perfectly, that means if there's some random noise in the unmeasured covariate, uh, unmeasured confounder, then what would happen? So under the more uh, theoretical uh, assumptions that I found that the propensity score, the estimates from the large scale propensity score model will always uh, be less biased than the propensity, the estimate from the manual propensity score uh, method. So this simulation summarizes the, how the theory works in practice. So in this simulation, the true causal effect is two. A model that does not adjust for anything is highly biased, the estimate is four. The method adjusting for manually selected confounders but missing a confounder, it is less biased but still biased, the effect estimate is three. So when the unmeasured confounder is pinpointed, then our SPS without adjusting for the unmeasured confounder is unbiased. It recovers the ground truth. And when the assumptions uh, gets um, further and further violated, then the bias in our SPS will increase and that converges to the manual propensity score method. So this illustrates how the theory works uh, in a simulated setting. And it's always more interesting to look at how it works in practice using real world data. And that's uh, what I'm going to show you here. So I carry out an empirical evaluation using EHR data. I compare the two antihypertensive drugs on two clinical outcomes, acute myocardial infarction and chronic uh, kidney disease. For both health outcomes, type 2 diabetes is a known confounder that if it affects doctors' decision on what treatment to give, and it is a risk factor for both uh, outcomes. So we compare methods with and without adjusting for the type, type 2 diabetes, and we compare the effect estimates from the different uh, approaches. The methods we compared are uh, the same as the simulation, unadjusted, and the manual propensity score model with and without adjusting for type 2 diabetes. And for the manual propensity score approach, I try to mimic what the researchers would do I conduct a literature review and have that uh, to and take the uh, union, like all the confounders from those published studies and have that reviewed by uh, clinicians. And that's the variables that I include in the propensity, manual propensity score method. And we also have our large scale propensity score method with and without adjusting for type two diabetes. Right, so this figure showed that the estimates from the five methods on the clinical outcome acute myocardial infarction. So the unadjusted method is highly biased. And first, we found, we found that uh, there's a bigger difference in the effect estimates from the manual propensity score approach with and without adjusting for type 2 diabetes compared to the, those two estimates from large-scale propensity score. In other words, LSPS is more robust to uh, the unmeasured confounder than the uh, propensity score approach that you adjusting for a manually selected uh, set of covariates. And the same was observed for the second clinical outcome, chronic kidney disease, that the estimate we, uh, there was a bigger difference for the manual approach compared to the estimates from the LSPS. A second point I'd like to make 
here is that remember this is a real world study. So meaning that we don't know the true causal effect of the drug. So we're willing to accept that either many or large scale propensity score adjusting for type two diabetes could potentially be the ground truth. So in this graph, that means that anywhere between the two rod lines are where the possible values for the ground truth to be. Under this premise, our study still shows that uh, our PS is uh, potentially less biased because uh, when our PS does not adjust for type two diabetes, it is uh, often within closer to the two rut lines compared to the menu propensity score approach that does not adjust for type two diabetes. So to summarize the contribution of my work, this work include I identify the conditions under which our PS can adjust uh, can produce unbiased or less biased estimates than classical propensity score adjustment, adjustment methods and demonstrated the robustness of OSPS to unmeasured confounding on large scale uh, real world data. So next I'd like to uh, move to a related but different topic about how we can assess health equity from a causal perspective and specifically how can we assess uh, fairness of a treatment allocation. The health equity is a very broad topic. In this work, I focus on equity in clinical care setting and specifically on treatment allocation. Many factors could potentially influence physicians' treatment decisions like age, sex, race, genetics, comorbidities, and environmental factors. So how can we assess fairness of treatment allocation with EHRs? The clinical example I consider is coronary artery disease or CAD. Patients with CAD have narrower or blocked the coronary artery that reduce blood flow to the heart. And patients with CAD are at high risk of having acute myocardial infarction uh, that's a heart attack. There are two common clinical procedures to treat this condition. One is called percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI. It is minimally invasive and um, also less expensive compared to uh, the other treatment called the coronary artery bypass graft or cabbage. It is an open heart surgery that's much more expensive and more invasive. So previous studies have found that women, racial minorities, and patients without health insurance and with low income, uh, live in low income neighborhoods may have inadequate access to uh, the two procedures together, they call revascularization. So in my study, I try to answer the question, is there a sex-related bias in allocating, revascular, in allocating revascularization? So how can we assess, how can we answer that question? Right? How can we assess fairness? We need some metrics. There are many fairness metrics in the literature, and here are three popular ones, statistical parity, calibration, and accuracy. So what do they have in common is that they, all three metrics rely on association uh, between the covariates uh, outcome, uh, covariates with sensitive attribute, sex, and uh, that sometimes that also include the outcomes. And I will go through them one at a time. So the first one is statistical parity. It is the most commonly used metric in uh, health disparity research. It answers the following question, is the, is the treatment assigned at equal rate between men and women? Right? If the treatment probability is the same between men and women, then this metric suggests that there's no uh, disparity, implying there's no bias. Although in when I apply this metric to the CAD cohort that I extracted from our EHR database, I found that the men were 8% more likely to be treated than women. And does this imply that there's bias against women in getting the treatment? So before I answer that question, I wanna show a few more metrics. The second metric is called the calibration. Calibration uses an additional variable, the outcome to define fairness. So this, Metric uh, answers the question, does heart attack happen at equal rate between men and women given their treatment status? If this is equal, the heart attack happens at equal rate given for men and women given their treatment status, then this metric uh, suggests that there's no bias. 
when I apply this metric, when I calculate these probabilities on the CAD cohort, I found that among people who were not treated, men were had a higher rate of having heart attack than women. So does this mean that more men, even more men should be treated because the, the risk for them is still higher? And there's a third metric uh, that assess fairness based on comparing the probability of being treated for men and women conditioned on their observed health outcome, whether they get a heart attack or not. And this metric again shows that there's uh, men were more likely to get the treatment than women. So does this suggest that there's bias against women? So now I put the, all these metrics together. So what did we learn? We learned that the conclusions about fairness depend on the fairness metric we choose. And potentially all these metrics are flawed because they only look at the association between a few variables. And we know that the patients are different in their baseline characteristics in the risk factors. So how can we assess fairness while accounting for that fact that patients are different at the baseline? And this is, uh, without proving to you, I just assert here that this can be actually understood from a causal um, perspective. In the causal fairness literature, there's a fairness definition called the principle of fairness. The idea is that maybe it's more reasonable to assess fairness among patients who would benefit similarly from the treatment. And this metric was uh, proposed by two statisticians, Ima and Jiang. So to adapt this concept into a clinical setting, the question is, how can we define patient similarity based on uh, their treatment response? The idea is that for binary treatment and binary outcome, we can define patient similarity uh, based on treatment response using the potential outcomes. So that is, we can categorize patients into one of the four groups. So what are they? The stable group include patients who would not have a heart attack regardless of whether they get the treatment or not. Right? Those patients are similar in terms of their response to treatment. And patients from the treatable group, their heart attack can be prevented if they get the treatment. And if they do not get the treatment, they would have a heart attack. And those people are in the treatable group. Some patients may do better without the treatment and they're in the better without group. And some patients may get the heart attack no matter whether they get the treatment or not. Maybe they're in a more uh, late stage of their uh, disease and those people are in the, uh, in the severe group. So these four groups stratify patients based on their uh, response to treatment and they are called uh, principal strata in uh, the causal inference uh, literature. So how can this help us assess fairness of treatment, right? So the idea is that conditioning on the principal strata, like conditioning on patients who would be affected similarly by the treatment, if there's no difference in getting the treatment uh, between men and women, then uh, this metric suggests that it, the, fair, the treatment is assigned in a fair way. Right, so instead of look, just looking at associations, here we include a causal estimate, the potential joint to potential outcomes that defines patient similarity based on how we think patients would be affected by the treatment. Recall that the joint potential outcomes are never observed for uh, any given individuals. So in order to estimate principal fairness, we first need to estimate the, the potential outcomes. And I build uh, models that to estimate the potential outcomes based on the large set of patient uh, covariates from the EHR. And that method, just like all other causal uh, inference method, requires uh, some assumptions. So when I apply the method to the CAD cohort, uh, the from EHR, our EHR database, I found that across all four principal strata, men were uh, about five to percent, uh, ten, five to ten percent 
more likely to receive the treatment than female, given that their benefit from the treatment uh, are the they are the same. So to summarize, the contribution of this work includes uh, I generalized the original formulation of principle fairness to a clinical setting and develop an estimation algorithm for principle fairness and demonstrate its performance with EHR data. So this concludes the work that I've done during my PhD. I talked about one project about how to reduce unmeasured confounding in observational studies with EHRs using a large scale propensity score method. And one project about how we can uh, measure fairness of treatment allocation from a causal perspective in, and the exact clinical example is coronary artery disease. So moving forward, I'm interested in um, developing generalized, personalized, fair, and generalizable AI in healthcare. And I think causal inference can uh, play an important role in, in achieving these nice properties that we, we, all, uh, we all like about uh, AI and uh, we all want to achieve in our AI and machine learning models. And that includes several specific directions. First is uh, I'm interested in developing methods for personalized treatment recommendation. Second, uh, detecting and quantifying and mitigating treatment disparities based on uh, causal mechanisms. Third, uh, I'm interested in developing generalizable models across locations and time. So for the first direction, I'm interested in developing methods for individual level treatment recommendation. While population level treatment effect can be useful in forming clinical guidelines, like though that's what LSPS estimate, right? But it may not always reflect how the treatment would work for a particular patient because patient may respond differently to treatment depending on their individual characteristic and also their longitudinal uh, uh, disease uh, progression. So being able to estimate treatment effect at an individual level are important uh, for, uh, I think they are, are important and maybe more valuable uh, for doctors at the point of care. So I'm interested in building methods that can take not only cross-sectional, but also temporal medical records for individual level uh, treatment effect estimation. And there are questions about how we can uh, learn patient representations from high dimensional features and how should we assess reliability of our effect estimates in the individual setting. And those are the questions that I'm, I'm really interested in studying from a methodol methodological perspective. The second I'm interested in is detecting and quantifying uh, bias in clinical decision making. So understanding causal mechanism of bias in clinical practice can guide efforts in combating health inequities and also guide algorithm design so that algorithms won't perpetuate the existing bias in the data. I hope to study how can we uh, decompose bias based on causal mechanisms. Oftentimes these days we found there's a disparity in treatment that's, uh, that's associated with sex and race, but how can we decompose or explain that total disparity based on the specific causal mechanisms. Right? Is there direct bias? Uh, that's like doctors base their decision, treatment decision explicitly on someone's sex or race, or is there indirect bias? Like the disparities in treatment we see is due to the mediated effect of social determinants of health or differences in patients' medical conditions and maybe like there are differences in uh, genetics. Also, how much of that uh, uh, disparities may can be explained by the difference in demographics? For example, maybe more black patients are younger, uh, right? So age and uh, uh, race could be uh, correlated, and that could uh, and age is a risk factor for is a variable that often takes into account in decision making. So how can we explain? Uh, how much of that disparity is explained by uh, other demographics. And they, uh, so this will be the main focus of my chalk talk tomorrow. 
and uh, I would like to discuss this in more uh, details. And then how can we use this knowledge, our understanding about the cause uh, disparities to further build uh, fairness aware models. The third uh, and last direction that I'm interested in is uh, developing generalizable models. Models that we train on one side can, how can we deploy that at different sites or across diff at different time? So first off, I think there's a lot of uh, research question that need to be addressed. For example, even what is generalizability? Generalizability, what we want to be generalizable? Are, are those the model parameters or is that the training procedure that, we, that needs to be generalizable? And how do we train models that's robust to the, and why models are not failed to generalize, right? One potential reason and important reason is probably the data from the, at different sites are very different. There's a distribution shift or something called covariate shift. So how can we train models that are robust to distribution shift across sites and time? And um, how, so that we can have a model that's, uh, that works uh, equally well at uh, multiple sites. And that's all I have prepared for today. I would like to thank my advisors and the collaborators for their guidance and support. And thank you for your attention. With that, I would like to uh, have to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lin Ying. That was wonderful. Um, does anyone have any questions? Well, oh, go ahead, Tom. Oh, thanks, Audrey. Yeah, I just want to second that. That was a terrific talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lin Yang. Um, two questions. First, um, the uh, have you run any of these methods on data that wasn't already harmonized to a common data model? I'm wondering about that internal structure and how it affects the success or failure uh, of the methods. That's a that's a great question. I think it it can definitely be my next research project. Uh, for my PhD research that I, uh, I I've done at Columbia, those are or the two projects I went into more details in depth today are um, built on the OMAP common data model. So um, yeah, I don't I I don't know I I. I it, would, it wouldn't be a surprise to me if there's a difference in performance if I apply the same method to the, uh, the uh, database that's in a different uh, data format. Yeah, I think it will be a, a, an interesting uh, question. Great, great. Second question, um, you know, you mentioned that when you are sort of con constructing the um, large scale propensity score that you, um, you remove relationships identified as mediators and instruments and a couple of different forms of colliders. That seems like a non-trivial thing to do. And I'm curious how you did that. Uh, the, for, tree, uh, for mediators and uh, colliders. So we did, we, we, we avoid those variables in the study design because by definition, those variables are post-treatment uh, variables. So when we do a uh, feature extraction, right, we only include variables that are pre-treatment, uh, like for example, diagnosis and medication records that, that happen uh, within a year prior to the treatment initiation date. So we based on the, the time in the, in the medical record to pick a pre-treatment covariance. Um, and that's, so we didn't pick like you know variables things that are measured after the patient takes took the treatment or any condition codes that happened after the, the patient uh, already started uh, the treatment. Okay. Okay. So not necessarily mediators of the treatment decision, but mediators of the treatment effect. That makes sense. Uh, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
So while everyone else is thinking about their question, um, I have a question. I really think your work on causal inference and observational data is really interesting. I've been hearing a lot about how um, studies using randomization, so the gold, quote unquote, gold standard randomization studies and the causal inference on observational studies can actually be triangulation in terms of you highlighted a few reasons why randomized studies might not be valid. And another reason might be that in real life, people might not be able to adhere or take a medication or something in the same way that they would in a randomized trial. And so we get other information from our studies and observational, and then combining the two of them together, randomization and observation um, can, can help us have a better idea of the true causal effect. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about combining some of your work with work from randomized trials or some of that, if you've heard or thought about the triangulation. Perfect. Yeah, maybe let me stop share so I can uh, see your uh, face and uh, feels more natural a uh, conversation that way. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there actually has been work on integrating randomized controlled trial data with electronic health record to uh, further uh, improve the reliability of causal effect estimates. So I forgot the detail how, but I think that's it, it's something that you know when I when I when I saw it, I think it's a, a really uh, good idea to do because uh, for observational research, right, when doing causal inference with observational data, uh, validation is all, all, always a, a challenge because causal inference with observational data would make assumptions here for example uh, I showed right how this often assumed assumption no unmeasured confounder can be it's an untestable assumption other people assume that because right what else can we do if it's unmeasured it's unmeasured so we, we just assume that and proceed with our method and our interpretation of the the, the effect size uh, however so one I showed here an example is that when we now have large scale data like EHR, when you have like 60,000 covariates, including often, maybe you are at a uh, better chance of uh, adjusting for variables that may be not directly measured in your data by leveraging the, the correlation. So it's kind of a way of, um, uh, you know, relaxing some of the traditional causal assumptions that are baked into causal inference. However, I think incorporating other data, as you suggest, you know, uh, randomized controlled trial data, because in that setting, we know that the treatment is randomized. And uh, if we get the like patient level uh, data, then that can maybe help us guide, maybe, you know, setting the priors or uh, uh, something else that, you know, to guide our study design of our observational uh, research. So at a high level to summarize, I think combining those two data types uh, is we can we can do a lot of more when we integrate those uh, data different data types. Wonderful, thank you. So I see we have about five minutes left, and that uh, Sri has a question, and then maybe Vitali, and that should probably wrap us up. I think. Thanks. Um, a great great seminar. Um, I was just wondering about the principal strata definition. Could you do that with her? I was wondering, maybe this is slightly an extension of Audrey's question. It seems like you could define the different potential outcome models using trial data, where um, there there is there shouldn't be uh, any bias in allocation of treatment. Um, and I wonder, have you tried to do that where you develop the using trial data and then those models, apply those models in EHR using the EHR data? That's a great question and great suggestion. I have not tried, um, but I want to try it right, right after this uh, presentation. <laughs> yeah, so there uh, with randomized trial data, uh, assume the randomization is, is successful, then there's no confounding 
Um, so building up uh, to, so how do we estimate the potential outcome for from randomized controlled trial? Does that make it an easier or like we're less, does that help with our uh, evaluation or does it help us, is it more likely our uh, estimation of the potential outcomes are, are uh, unbiased? Mm. That's what yeah, I, mean. yeah. I think. I think. I think. Yeah, there, there, there is potential advantage of using uh, RCTs. You might have limited inference to people who in the EHR who resemble trial participants. Mm -hmm. That's a separate issue potentially. But anyway, just a thought. I just wanted to say, really interesting talk. Thanks a lot. Um, as somebody who doesn't know a whole lot about causal analysis, and the only thing I know about it is I read Judea Pearl's book like two years ago or three years ago, and I can't really even say I understood all of it. I'm curious, what is the impact of sample size on some of the some of the conclusions you can make from this kind of analysis? So, like in one of them, you had you know you broke things up into four groups in terms of um, the effect of surgery. Um, you know, is there a requirement that all these groups need to have the same sample size? And what happens if one of the, the there's a lot of imbalance between the groups? Yeah, um, so I will answer this question in uh, two ways. Maybe one is more general, right? When you have a limited sample size, when you want to do a causal inference, what would happen? And then I can go into more the details about the principle fairness, the, the four groups. So overall, when uh, that's a, that first, that's a great question, and when we do large scale analysis, meaning right, when we include like in genomics, in imaging, and in EHR uh, data analysis, when we include all covariates, right, they, it's large scale. What what can happen? So often, right, if you build a logistic regression, that means you have that, that many degrees of uh, uh, freedom, and you need to you need to have more. You need to have way more uh, samples than your covariates in order to add, so your model is more robust. Otherwise, uh, your your model can you know can trap in some uh, uh, local uh, minimum when you do like stochastic uh, gradient descent. So that's a, a very important question. You know, it's it's important when you have more samples. It's always good. It's always good to have more. But when you don't. Uh, there are a couple things um, we can do. First is that a uh, common thing we do with linear models is do regularization. So, you know, you kind of select covariates um, by doing uh, cross validation to set, select your hyperparameters and to reduce the kind of feature space. And that's also where uh, other machine learning models like um, other like a latent, latent factor models can play a role is to that you learn because at the high dim, the high dimensional covariates are uh, correlated, so that means you really don't need that many uh, many dimensions to represent the data, right? The data can be represented with the lower dimensional uh, latent variables, so uh, we can learn lower dimensional latent representation. With uh, like you know variational autoencoder, if you want to be fancy, that's what people use nowadays to learn a lower dimensional representation, and then work on the the uh, the, the the low dimensional uh, features that you learned from your uh, machine learning model. Uh, to but the kind of downside with that approach is that the the latent dimensions are not often not very interpretable. So you lose some interpretability and that can be a critical issue in uh, uh, healthcare when we need to be able to explain right, why models make certain choices or make certain predictions. So there's a pros and cons in, in that. Um, and for the, uh, the work that I did, the principle of fairness, uh, do I need a, like equal sample size enough for principle strata uh, no, although it will affect my the reliability of effect um, my fairness conclusion. If one group that has a very small sample size 
uh, right? If it really is like 10, 20 or that few patients, then comparing the difference in getting treatment up among those 20 patients, maybe not very uh, uh, representative of the true uh, scenario. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Great question. Thank you so much again, Lin Ying. This was a really, really great talk and really delighted to have you here. And I personally am looking forward to meeting with you tomorrow and I'm sure everyone else is as well. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the great questions and for your time.